In the 2016 election, Weed got more votes than Donald Trump in California, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Montana, and Florida. Red states are turning green, and by and large, the U.S. population is in favor of cannabis legalization. With the medicinal, economical, and environmental benefits of the marijuana industry being recognized, there has been a slow gain in bipartisan support in favor of cannabis reform and federal legalization. However, this support only adds to the hypocrisy that there still remain dozens upon dozens of men and women serving life in prison for marijuana crimes. Amidst the progress, their stories must not be forgotten. While politicians and entrepreneurs find their place in the cannabis industry, marijuana lifers are literally dying in prison. Ricardo Riojas is 75 years old. He served 22 years of his life sentence for conspiracy to commit money laundry and continuing criminal enterprise. Riojas' family has been actively in pursuit of his release as his health is depleting. He's had surgery while in custody, is in a wheelchair, and has a heart condition. All of this makes Ricardo eligible for the Compassionate Release Program, but his petitions for clemency have been denied. He's 75 years old. He also is in a wheelchair, and he's in poor health. He's dying, and he's in for pot. I don't even know where to begin, other than at this stage, just beg President Trump to do the right thing. And I actually feel like if somebody could sit down and talk to him, that he could understand that he has the power to free Ricardo and all these other pot prisoners. Pot prisoner like Antonio Bascaro, the longest serving marijuana lifer, has been incarcerated since 1980. This 83-year-old, first-time, nonviolent offender was charged with conspiracy to import and distribute marijuana, while the others from his case have long been released. The octogenarian grandfather, who served in the Bay of Pigs, is in poor health and suffers from severe back problems, glaucoma, and other ailments. Antonio will be eligible for release in the summer of 2019, but his daughter Aisha, who lost her father to prison when she was 12 years old, fears that may be too late. Noah Kleinman, a medical marijuana dispensary owner in California, was sentenced to 17 and a half years in federal prison for intent to distribute marijuana. The 43-year-old father of two is still battling for a commutation of his sentence, or else remains behind bars until 2030. He was operating dispensaries in Los Angeles for a couple years, and then he ended up shipping some marijuana out of state, which is something that happens every day, all day long. And it just turned out that, unfortunately, he was friends with someone who was a federal informant who had given him a cell phone. And in fact, it went to the government. And so every single ounce of marijuana, kilo of marijuana went through the dispensary was basically recorded in text messages according to the government server, as well as out of state quantities. All the other people involved in the dispensary ended up pleading out and becoming informants. And basically the judge used the law to add up all the quantities that he had sold, both in the state and out of the state, to come to 17 years. Crystal Munoz's story is just as hard to swallow. A young mother of two little girls, Crystal is a victim of one of the most absurd enforcements of conspiracy law. Crystal was convicted on the testimony of three people who had already served three years that she used to know and associate with, and they were incentivized. They were told, hey, if you can feed more people into the system, maybe you'll get a sentence reduction. I don't think she sold marijuana. I don't think there's any evidence that she did. But the DEA knocked on her door one day and they said, you're not in any trouble. And they lied. They said, you know, we just want you to come to our headquarters and we want to ask you a few questions. And she was pregnant. And Ricky Munoz is her husband. And Ricky said she left with them. And he said, I don't think you should go. She goes, no, no, I don't have a problem. Crystal is Native American. She lives on a reservation. And they wanted her to draw a map 
and they said, can you show us where all the checkpoints are on the reservation, which are federal checkpoints where you have to stop? And do you know the back roads, how to circumvent those checkpoints? And she did, and she drew a map for them. And they used that as evidence against her because some of her friends who were in had implied that she had told them where the back roads were. She ended up with 19 years, 11 months for I don't even know what. And she was shackled while she delivered her daughter. And she stayed up all night long, just holding her baby and staring into her baby's face because she knew she had to surrender her baby. It's sad that at this day and time when there's so much knowledge about the cannabis plant, and yet there's still prisoners being held for long, lengthy sentences. I mean, even one day or one year is too much, but to give someone a natural death sentence, life without parole for cannabis, it doesn't make sense. Still like the stigma and this mentality that we have in this country that, you know, from the war on drugs era that, you know, people are still, they're still trapped in this time warp or something. It's like, what is wrong with these people? Like, when is the world gonna wake up? You know, when is the world gonna realize what's been done to me and these other people for weed? These are prisoners of war, they're left on the battlefield, and we shouldn't leave people on the battlefield so that everybody else can have a big party and celebrate and get rich and not care that there are people who they're suffering every single day. And we have to end it. We have to end it. The imbalance, negative, and unjust consequences of the war on drugs are well known and finally being acknowledged by both parties. Democrats and Republicans are coming together to do the right thing. Push forth legislation to protect states from a federal cannabis crackdown, and furthermore, call for proper research to validate the medicinal benefits of marijuana. On the forefront of this effort is Congressman Earl Blumenauer, founder of the Cannabis Caucus and co-creator of the recently approved Warbacher Blumenauer Amendment. He is actively pushing for bipartisan support for cannabis legalization. The politics are moving in our direction. We won eight out of nine elections in very diverse states last fall. We have now some form of cannabis that is legal for over 300 million Americans. There's a disconnect between some of the federal law enforcement war on drug bureaucracy, and there are some hints that the administration is not going to be helpful, but Donald Trump didn't campaign against cannabis, and his few public statements indicate that he thinks the states ought to be able to go ahead with their experiment. We have what we call the CJS Amendment. It is passed in the White House every year, and it states that the government is defunded from raiding any state that has marijuana law of any form. So that is our protection. Plus, we also have AB 1578, which is our state bill that has three different layers of protection that doesn't allow local law enforcement to communicate with the federal government. And so without that communication, it makes things very difficult for the federal government to interfere with states' rights. Around the country, we're obviously moving away from the fear mongering around marijuana use. But unfortunately, this drug continues to be a Schedule One drug under federal statute, and that presents a problem. Even for the people that are, for instance, in the retail business of marijuana here, you cannot bank that money into a federally insured banking institution because you run the risk of that money being confiscated by the federal government. It's absolutely unfair that state legal cannabis businesses cannot fully deduct their business expenses for tax purposes. Taxation is another issue. They overtax us, then the illicit market will be able to thrive and thrive even more because they will take our patients and customers. We can't kill the illicit market unless we lower the taxes and then make competition for us stronger and for them weaker to where we crush them out. These are things that are within our power. These are things that are common sense. These are things that have more and more support. And we have to stay focused. This has been a long-term struggle.
since the federal government started its war on cannabis 70 years ago. We've made more progress in the last five or six years than in the previous half century, but we have to keep at it. Congressman Blumenauer's legalization efforts are finally taking root with the help of even more recent legislation in the form of the Marijuana Justice Act. Composed of two companion bills, introduced by Representative Barbara Lee in the House and Senator Cory Booker in the Senate, the Marijuana Justice Act proposes to legalize marijuana at a federal level. With 12 Democratic co-sponsors, including Bernie Sanders, the Marijuana Justice Act will, of course, need bipartisan support. What it would do would be, one, take it from the list of federal one substances. Two, it would provide for automatic expungement of those convicted of misdemeanor marijuana charges, which is thousands of, of individuals. Three, it would allow those convicted of felony convictions to go before the court and petition the court to expunge their records. And four, it would provide for, which is extremely important, a $500 million restorative justice fund that would provide for these individuals to really rebuild their lives. The actual political progress has all been in favor of eliminating the failed prohibition on cannabis. It is important that people who are in this space, people who are advocates, people who are patients, providers, business people, that they keep up their engagement, their pressure. It's important that people don't be distracted one way or another, not to get overconfident or unduly pessimistic. This has always been a struggle. We need to continue our momentum with more progressive legislation at the state and local level. But we've got, I'd say, five years of concerted effort. And the fact that we may run into some choppy waters with this administration ought to encourage people to do more. But I've been doing this for decades. And I have never been more confident that we are going to successfully resolve this issue sooner rather than later that we will never elect an anti-cannabis president again. And we've got some short-term challenges that if we do our job right, we'll be okay. Whether it be five years, two years, 10 years, or could we see legalization happening sooner than we think? Even during the course of creating this series, federal and state cannabis laws have evolved exponentially. Where in January of 2018, a federal cannabis crackdown was being considered by Jeff Sessions, just three months later, President Trump made a public commitment to support a federalism-based solution to fix the state's rights issue once and for all. And Senator Chuck Schumer is working to remove cannabis from the list of federally controlled substances. It's an interesting moment in our country right now. I think President Trump has been sort of grappling you know, making comments here and there about possible decriminalization of marijuana at the federal level. And I really do think we're on the brink of something. All of this points to the tremendous distance the marijuana industry has come. Ultimately, this great success for the business gives all the more reason for the reviewing and release of marijuana lifers and the need for an immediate investigation into the rampant incarceration of nonviolent marijuana offenders. If you use cannabis, if you treat yourself with medical marijuana, if you don't smoke but your friends do, if you use CBD lotion for your back pain, if you believe in justice and logical legislation, if you are a cannabis advocate, then be an activist. Join Mary Jane in signing a change.org petition aimed at gaining the attention of our congressmen and women to actively write and push for legislation in favor of federal cannabis legalization, and thus the release of those serving life for weed, the prisoners of prohibition.